Hi everybody, it's Josh with Talk About Trek, and we are back to fill in a missing piece. If you've ever done a puzzle and kind of put in one of those final pieces, this is what this video kind of feels like for me. Because an, uh, an eagle-eyed viewer has pointed out that I have reviews for all of the TNG numbered series, one through six, eight through 36. But for some reason, some reason, I never stopped to talk about masks. And I really thought that I did. Maybe I did and the video was deleted into the void. Maybe I didn't. Maybe I wasn't making videos at that time. But it's weird because I did, I did six and I did eight. But, you know, there's a gap there and maybe at that point I wasn't doing the videos as much. But anyway, once that was pointed out to me, I said, oh my God, I definitely got to go back because I can't have one missing piece just sitting there. That would be ridiculous. So now with this uh, rant and talk here about masks, we will be at our full one through 36 of Star Trek TNG of the numbered series. And, and that's kind of important too, and let me show you why. 36, for whatever reason, marks a point when they changed how they did the spines of the books. Look at that. So, 35, 36, 37, 38, all of a sudden, something new. So, it's kind of a, uh, a good turning point here, and a good, I don't know, point for the channel. That we got 1 through 36, or we will have 1 through 36 done, and... In the books, so to speak, uh, with our talk here today about John Vornholtz masks. And look, look at this book. This book has been uh, through hell and back, man. Look at that. Now, I know I read this. I did read it probably three and a half years ago, I would say. And then just, you know, didn't make a review for whatever reason at that time. Didn't make any notes. <clears throat> My notes only go back to the beginning of, Lord, where did we start our notes at? Oh, no. Uh, our notes started in the middle of 20, so probably like right before we started, you know, being more detailed about these wonderful books is when uh, I had read this before. So reading it again was a treat because it kind of came right back into my mind. And John Vornholt is an amazing Trek author. And this book here is his very first foray into Trek, into writing even. So uh, I have here on my desk the amazing book about books. And this is what uh, John Vornholt had to say about Masks. <clears throat> Masks was my first published adult novel, my first Star Trek book, and a bona fide bestseller that was the toast of the beaches in the summer of 1989. When the next generation was heating up, it was almost an instant book, and the process left me in a daze. Lorca is a primitive culture where everyone wears ornate masks, both for practical purposes and to denote their place in society. I was the first one to get... Well, I'm getting into spoiler territory now. I'm not going to read the rest. Uh, suffice it to say, it was his first book, and he did some interesting things in it. And let's just go on with the normal, uh, normal what we do here. Uh, Captain Picard and Commander Riker must struggle for, survi for survival on a primitive, war-torn world. <clears throat> and from the back. The Enterprise journeys to Lorca. A beautiful world with a feudal culture where the inhabitants wear masks to show their rank and station. There, Captain Picard and away team don masks of their own to begin a quest for the planet's ruler and the great wisdom mask that the leader traditionally wears. Their mission to establish diplomatic relations. But shortly after transporting, Picard and his party lose contact with the ship, and Commander Riker leads a search party down to the planet to find them. Both men, however, are unaware that their searches, indeed the ship's entire mission, are part of a madman's plan. 
a madman who is setting the stage for a trap that will ensnare both the Enterprise landing parties and leave him poised to seize control of the awesome Wisdom Mask and the planet Lorca itself. That's actually a very well done back because that just kind of just covers what this book really is about. So, uh, masks. Um, before we dive into full spoilery territory, uh, basically you have a a fantasy adventure. So you're taking your taking your Trek crew and you're throwing them into a very different situation, which I mean a lot of these novels are about, you know. So you're throwing them into this fantasy fantasy situation and this very interesting world where it is a human colony that was settled by a traveling theater troupe and a group of kind of anti-technology people who just wanted to live off the land. They get to this planet, which they think is nice. However, when they get there, uh, volcanic eruptions destroy the uh, their landing craft and their, their ship and also render any technology they have useless. And then, you know, a few maybe 100 years later or whatever, this is what you've got. You've got this new society, which wears all these masks. Everybody wears masks. It's basically the same as wearing pants. You know, you if you saw someone without wearing pants, it would be the same thing. You know, that's what they feel if you don't have your mask on. So everybody wears masks, and the masks denote your station in the, um, in the world there. So uh, this book, as the cover... And the cover is very cool. I love the cover a lot. And I was able to find that the cover artist is Mielo Sintron. I hope I'm saying that right. But uh, the, co the, uh, the cover features Riker and Picard there. And then one of the intricate masks. And I want to say that's the ambassador's mask. We'll come back to that later. But anyway, uh, the cover looks awesome. Uh, Riker and Picard. So this is a Riker and Picard centric story they kind of take the uh, the center stage here with each of them leading their perspective away teams but it is like a lot more than that it really is kind of like this fantasy adventure and the the culture and the way that the away teams kind of get into the culture of Lorca is very interesting as well too so uh, th that was very cool just a very well done book and very fun and glad that it was I was pointed out that I hadn't talked about it because it deserves to be talked about. Uh, John Vornholt writes so many good Trek books and you can tell right from the very get go that he knows what he's doing. So masks, two thumbs up, two live long and prospers, all that stuff. Read it if you're into these kind of things. And if you're watching this, I imagine that you are. Uh, okay, that's the end of me not spoiling the book. Now we'll just kind of go into a little bit more detail about what I liked about the story, you know, and what was going on with all that, because there was definitely a lot that was going on in this book to talk about. Uh, basically, the book starts out with the Enterprise picking up this ambassador, Fenton Lewis, who's got this fancy ambassador's mask, which I believe is the one featured there on the cover of the book. But the idea is that they're going to head to this human colony and with this mask try to establish relations with the ruler, or the uh, who they believe to be the ruler, this uh, rumored almighty slayer. The names of all the people on this planet are just that cool. That's just, the get, that's just how you start, almighty slayer. So almighty slayer is the leader, or the, the ruler of this planet, because he has the wisdom mask and whoever has the wisdom mask basically is the ruler of the planet and people can challenge him for that but he's successfully defended his his rule for like 30 years so uh, they're going there they want to try to find him so uh, they go down with an away team and at first of course Riker's like you know you really shouldn't be doing this captain but this uh, Fenton Lewis kind of talks Captain Picard into wanting to go down and see this very interesting culture. So the initial away team consists of uh, Captain Picard, uh, Counselor Troy, Fenton Lewis, 
and I believe uh, I think Worf is down in the first away team. Man, I don't know if I'm getting that right or not. Anyway, so the first away team beams down, and immediately upon beaming down, they beam down basically next to an active volcano. So, like, <laughs> right off the get-go, it was kind of off to a bad start for them. All of their equipment is immediately kind of rendered useless. So the, the, Enterprises lose, the Enterprise lose contact with the away team, so they set up to beam their next away team down, led by Commander Riker. So the first away team, when they beam down, they beam down without, or they beam down with like these uh, kind of silly Halloween masks, uh, because that's what the computer has in its, you know, in its database. So they don't have traditional Lorcan-like masks. So I think uh, Picard has like a, a devil mask, uh, Worf has a pig mask, and uh, I think uh, Counselor Troy has a Harlequin mask. So they're, they're prepared and they have their silly masks and they beam down with Ambassador Lewis and get, lose, lose contact with the Enterprise immediately. And then they kind of set out to seek contact with somebody. They're like, all right, well, we're going to find a road. Like initially, like the whole thing seems very poorly planned on their part. Like they come down, they don't really seem to have a great plan on where to go. Maybe they should have just beamed down a little bit closer to everybody but then it wouldn't have been a very good story. So anyway, they have lost contact with the ship, and now they uh, they are looking for the uh, looking for basically anybody. So uh, now the the second away team that comes down, Commander Riker's away team, and he's got uh, Pulaski with him. He's got a couple of other... He's got Data with him. That's right, he's got Data. And he brings uh, a couple of Ensigns, Ensign Greenblatt and another one. And they all come down maskless. They are not prepared. And when they come down, they come upon uh, someone coming down the road in a wagon whose name is Daytimer. And he wears the mask of a proprietor, which looks like a, kind of like a big son. Or like a... So basically, he's like a salesman there in the world. So he's got a wagon, and he also has a friendly, kind of ape-like companion who he calls Reba, who's in and out of the trees, kind of resembles maybe like a cross between like an ape, ape and a sloth. And him and Reba, well, first are aghast at seeing all of these people basically naked. Uh, to him, that's what it's like. He's like, oh my God, put your clothes on. And he's like covering his eyes, like, what are you doing? You're out here maskless. So imagine just people running around pantsless, you know, completely showing everything. And that's how these people are seeing it. So uh, basically the away team works together with him and they agree to be his apprentices. And they all make these clay masks for themselves and kind of um, join up with Daytimer so that they can search out for their other away team. Now the other away team has met up with another group of uh, equally really awesome named people uh, led by the the mighty Piercing Blade. So Piercing Blade is the, uh, the the female leader of this group of this group of Lorcans basically whose quest is to chase down the Almighty Slayer because they want her to be the queen. This Almighty Slayer has been like in hiding for years and years and years. Nobody's even seen him or his mask. Uh, she wears the awesome thunder mask. Uh, the masks are like really cool and like described very well in this, and it's like a very big part. I won't get too in depth on that, except for like giving their names. But she wears a thunder mask, which is a really really great mask, and she's got like this whole band of people with her, uh, with equally cool names: uh, Medicine Maker, Cold Angel, Spider Wing. It's like everybody has these. Silly names. Nobody has, like, a real name, but, but they're very cool, and I guess they go along with their very cool masks that everybody wears here. But anyway, Picard and crew meet up with them, and uh, they're able to... They kind of actually end up, like, trading up a little bit, and then, like, some of them, they trade their masks for some better masks, and uh, they're able to integrate themselves kind of into Piercing Blade's group, through a little bit of deception. Uh, at first, uh, well, I think like uh, Fenton Lewis said, dude, he ends up running away. He's, he like uh, jets out in the middle of the night. Uh, they have a, uh, 
basically a duel between Picard and Piercing Blade, where Picard has Worf cheat to stun her, um, and kind of that way he can take control of the group. Uh, you know, it's a little dishonorable, but, you know, he had to do what he had to do to find, you know, to, to complete the mission, basically. So I'm leaving out a lot of things here, believe me. There, there's a lot more to this than, than what I'm ranting about here. I'm just covering the, the high notes and what I think was really, really cool about it. Uh, so you have the two different, basically that's where you're at. On the Enterprise in orbit, not much is happening. Geordi is in command, but they're pretty much stymied. They really can't do anything because of the the volcanic activity. They can't scan, they can't find anybody. So they're just kind of up there, kind of, you know, biting their fingernails. Not much they can do. However, a Ferengi uh, marauder shows up in orbit and starts beaming some people down. And they do establish contact, and basically they say, well, we're, you know, we're doing some away missions here, too, or whatever. You know, we're allowed to do that. So now they have a, a another problem, which is, what are these Ferengi doing on this planet here? So so with the, uh, the two groups kind of separate from each other, but kind of seeking one another, maybe even not even knowing it, uh, Benton Lewis the ambassador kind of reveals his true colors, you know, and he's not really there to advance the mission of Starfleet. He's there for his own purposes. So he is trying to get the wisdom mask for himself. And one of the ways he does that is by kind of like inciting these two groups to fight each other. Oh, before that happens though, uh, Riker's group, which is traveling around with Daytimer, of course, they go to this village and when they're at this village, they successfully help repel a, a raider attack. And raiders always wear these red masks. And uh, it's kind of a big problem on Lorca, you know. Everyone's always worried about the raiders. But uh, the, the crew helps repel these raiders. Dr. Pulaski helps heal some people. Riker actually is forced to kill someone with a sword, which is like kind of haunts him for a little bit in the book, but isn't brought up too much more. But... Uh, just a very interesting thing there, because then the people of the village take the old raider masks and recolor them and give them back to them as, uh, as like, repainted masks. It's kind of showing what they did. So, like, she gets, uh, Dr. Pulaski gets, like, this doctor mask, and Riker gets this uh, fancy mask. And then um, the Ensign Green Black gets this Archer Black mask because she was zapping people with her phaser. So uh, just very cool. They get these masks now. And like, as the book goes on, like at first, everyone in the different away teams are like, like they don't really feel the whole mask thing, you know. But then they start to really get into it. And they're really getting like into the culture. And they start to really see how, how these masks can like, I don't know, how it is to be a Lorcan, you know. And they, like, start to actually, like, I don't know, kind of become Lorcans themselves almost by everything that's going on with them. So, <clears throat> uh, they continue on down the road with Daytimer in his wagon when they come across a, uh, a group at the crossroad, which is two Ferengis in masks, of course. But they know that they're Ferengis because they got these extra wide masks covering their ears, you know. So, they come across these Ferengis. Riker is currently hiding out in the wagon, and they're not all out there, but they, uh, they trick, or they, uh, they ask for a diversion, because the Ferengis are getting a little uppity, and they want to basically take the masks and see what this guy's got in his wagon, uh, Riker asks for a diversion from Wesley, Wesley can only think of one thing, which is to fire a, uh, not an active photon torpedo, but like a, um, a dud photon torpedo into a volcano to create like a little tremor. That's a heck of a diversion. And that's exactly what actually what happens. So this giant diversion causes this huge tremor everywhere across the planet, basically. Uh, even kills part of Piercing Blade's member. Uh, Spider Wing is killed when uh, a rock shoots up out of a bog and like hits him in the face. So like it's kind of a like, this little diversion causes this kind of big problem for everybody. But then it, like, advances the, the story along as well. So, uh, they eventually, the, uh, that causes them to lose the, uh, the pony in the wagon, which kind of goes crazy and crashes. 
uh, where Ensign Greenblatt finds in the crashed wagon another mask, which Daytimer grabs and covets, and then he kind of walks away for a minute. And then he comes back as the almighty slayer wearing the wisdom mask. Oh, my God, right? Yeah, I know. I, I remembered it from the first time, so it wasn't as good of a turn this time. But, oh, my God, like, right? I mean, you kind of figured. He showed his skill earlier. But he is an old man, you know. But now he is the almighty slayer once again with the wisdom mask. And it's at this point when they, they run into Fenton Lewis again, who kind of is, he keeps, like, switching back and forth between away teams. I'm not sure what he's doing. But anyway, seeing the wisdom mask throws his plan into action, and in the middle of the night tries to stun and take it off of him. Unbeknownst to him, he switched masks with Data, and uh, the stun has no effect. Lewis runs off into the woods and ends up running into Piercing Blade and Picard's group. And I am just going to barely cover the fact that Picard and Piercing Blade have a smoldering romance in this book, which, as John Vornholt wrote here, uh, I was the first one to get Picard in an intimate relationship, and the story has an unusual high fantasy feel to it. So, so this is like Picard's first uh, f first love, really. If you look at you know Beta and Alpha Cannon together, right? Him and Piercing Blade, they don't really fall in love, but they have this kind of passion for each other. And Piercing Blade even takes off her mask and shows Picard his face. Now they have this very, like I said, very. Uh, very smoldering romance that happens throughout the book. And I won't get into too much about that because we're getting close to the end here because Fenton Lewis now comes to Piercing Blade's group to say, Almighty Slayer's group is right there. You've been searching for him. Now's the time to go get him. And Piercing Blade and her crew are like, yeah, that's right. It is time to go get him. But they're not going to sneak up. They're kind of like marching up there to go see him. And as they're marching up there to go see them, um, uh, Riker and Pulaski are the ones to kind of meet the initial group. So you have this very interesting kind of part where they're like, they see each other, but they don't know who they are because everybody has these masks on, you know. Uh, they end up meeting up, the groups end up meeting up, and of course they end up they end up battling because that's how it is on Lorca. So uh, it's revealed at this point that Piercing Blade is, of course, of course, the daughter of the Almighty Slayer. How could she be anyone else but the daughter of the Almighty Slayer? Uh, they battle, and Piercing Blade bests her. But at the last moment, uh, her, her hand is stayed by Data, who saves the Almighty Slayer's life. But she has won the Wisdom Mask. But at this point, when everybody is also very kind of like, it's like a happy reunion, everyone's happy to see each other, Fenton Lewis takes his, his chance. He blasts Ensign Greenblatt with a phaser on full, puts a hole in her and kills her. Awful. Steals the wisdom mask and runs off into the woods. Everybody's kind of stunned, you know. They're like, what the heck? Uh, and then they send out, uh, I think, Worf and Riker and uh, someone else uh, chasing after. Uh, they follow and they see that uh, Lewis has reached a Ferengi encampment. And uh, Lewis thinks he's kind of got the upper hand on the Ferengi. He's got the wisdom mask. He has a phaser pistol in hand. So he goes into this encampment, uh, not noticing really this giant glowing orange ball above. So when he tries to kind of get the upper hand on the Ferengi, who are basically like, uh, no, you're just going to give us the mask, and then uh, then we'll talk. Uh, when he tries to shoot his phaser pistol, nothing happens. Uh, they have like an anti-phaser sphere above their camp, right? So they end up, uh, and their raider buddies, basically killing Fenton Lewis right then and there. Uh, he is. It's revealed earlier in the story that he actually murdered and stole that mask from some Ferengis earlier or something. So he's like wanted by the Ferengis, uh, dead or alive. And it's kind of funny. It's the same amount of money, dead or alive. So the Ferengis are like, well, since it's the same amount of money, dead or alive, he could escape if he's alive. Let's just kill him. And then they have one of the guys spear him. And that's the end of Fenton Lewis and his adventures. So it's kind of a fitting end to this jerk who came into the story just looking out for himself. But now the uh, the people of the Enterprise and the Lorcans have the problem of how to get the Wisdom Mask back from the Ferengis with the anti-phaser shield and all that. So they determine that they're going to sneak in as raiders themselves 
and then try to steal it and run away and kind of beam out. Uh, the Almighty Slayer and Cold Angel, as they're approaching the camp, throw away their communicators and say, that's not how Lorcan's roll. We're not going to beam out. We're going to fight to the end, however it is. However, when they get to the camp, what do they find? The Lorcans there strung up and killed the Ferengis, stripped them naked, and then fought amongst themselves to the last man for the Wisdom Mask. Which an uh, Almighty Slayer then says, well, yes, this has happened before. So basically they kept challenging and challenging and challenging each other until there's just one person left with the mask who was so wounded that all he could do was put on the mask and then lay down and die. Right? <laughs> so anyway, uh, there's no kind of big battle at the end. That's how it's... Uh, I loved how it ended, actually. Very interesting that they get there. You're expecting all this more to happen. But no, that's not how it's going to go here. So they do that, and then they are... Uh, they beam back up to the Enterprise, basically, and they... Of course, they have the, the Wisdom Mask is brought back, and it's it's given to Piercing Blade. And Piercing Blade then is going to go to this big fair. So they kind of beam back up to the Enterprise. Everyone takes a shower and refreshes themselves. It's been an awful you know series of days down there. So now they're feeling better. They're refreshed and all that. And they go back up to the Enterprise. And then they beam back down, I think maybe a couple days later, for the satisfying conclusion where uh, Piercing Blade is kind of ruling over this Lorca, which is kind of coming together now like a little bit better. And she's looking to rule it in a different way. And she's also looking to accept the help of the Federation because the planet is, it's a little unstable. So they're going to need a little bit of help to work through like the volcanic things and all that. But just a fun ending where like it's established that they're all going to kind of come down there and Picard's going to beam down again and have one more little soiree with, you know, uh, with a piercing blade. So just, just a very fun ending and a very fun book that, again, ends in a way you don't expect, but I had a lot of fun with. So, yeah, that was Masks. Masks is very good. And uh, John Vornholt, I would say one of my favorite Trek authors altogether. So glad to have read this one again, and I don't know where I'm going to go from here. I don't, I don't want to start 37 yet, I don't think. I think I want to do something different before I go into that next batch of TNG number novels. So we'll see where we're going to go from here. I'm not really sure. But uh, as always, everybody, thank you so much for watching. Live long and prosper. And we'll see you all in the next one. Bye.